Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now a part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Today I have Manuela Ramayo. Uh, she's a cell and molecular biologist in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Cornell University. And we're going to talk about uh, ants and uh, some interesting features about them. So, Manuela, thanks for coming. Thank you for inviting me, Richard. It's a huge pleasure for me to be able to talk about these topics that I love, ants and microbiome. Oh, good. Yeah, I've been looking for people that deal with the microbiome of ants. And it just so happens that My kids always leave food in their rooms. And so we have ants now that the weather's warming up, like swarming all over the place. And I don't know what kind they are, but I'm like, ugh. Yeah, so I I understand you. I have a kid as well and a dog. So yeah, ants love them. (laughs) And I grew up in Brazil as I'm Brazilian. So in the tropics, Mm. we have ants everywhere. (laughs) Well, how did did you get interested in them? Just because you grew up around them and you were curious or what's the story? So, yes, as a Brazilian, I grew up in the tropic with a lot of insects around, but was just in the college that I met my advisor, Dr. Oderico Rio Bueno, and he was fascinated uh, by ants. So I was starting to do my researchers uh, as an undergrad, and more I learned about them, the more I fell in love with all of these ants facts. But specifically, uh, spe- but speaking specifically about microbiome and symbiotic interaction, that it's a big part of my research today, I was first fascinated with Wolbachia and ants interaction. So Wolbachia, it's a very common bacteria in many insects, including ants. And we still know very little about the effects of this bacteria and what they can cause for the host. So this whole uh, unknown word of symbiotic interactions with micro or microorganisms and insect caught my attention. And with each study uh, that has been published, we are discovered that there is no one single standard or a single rule that can apply for the entire system. So these symbiotics, this symbi- symbiosis can be variable and complex, which make our tasks challenge, but also super fun and definitely that's why I'm very interested in continuing studying this. So you're focused on the, the microbiome of ants, or what's your particular focus? Yes, I'm, I'm uh, actually to understand the patterns of biodiversity, we must consider symbiotic interaction as they can shape the animal evolution. So, so I'm interested in questions that how we can change this symbiosis? How can we explain all of these diversities? So these kind of questions uh, that intrigues me and I love to study. But my researcher focuses on understanding the mechanism that impacts the microbiome communities, unraveling the role of the ecology, behavior, stage of the development, diet, and also the phylogeny of the host in these symbiotic interactions. And then to answer these questions, I use ants as a study model. And it is very known for several ant genera that symbiotic interactions with microbiome community have a profound impact for the host. So more than that, ants have a wide distribution across the globe, the globe, and they are immense uh, diversity and behaviors and ecology. And also, I think they are beautiful and they are fascinating. So this was a perfect combination for me. Okay. So what uh, you know? Have you sequenced the microbiome of, of various ant species? Like what what have you done in terms of the microbiome of ants? So we already uh, studied several different species, microbiome of different species, actually in different parts of the world. So different behaviors and everything. And one of the most recent studies published last year, one uh, ant that uh, it's called Vaciton ermigion. It's a predator uh, who lives in, um, in the neotropics. And when we we sequence their microbiomes associated. So for that particular project, we want to also test that the, revel, uh, the role of the diet for that specific 
uh, species because they are predators. So what is fascinating about this that it is uh, my collaborators was able to collect the entire colony that was sitting there, living there in a rainforest in French Guiana. So they bring this colony to the lab and we feed them with a different diet for a long time because we weren't expected to see some difference in their micro. But was surprising to all of us that even after a while in a different diet, keeping a lab, we found no change in their, their microbes in the, associated with these ants. Um, and this was very huge thing for me because I thought that if you're changing the diet, we are changing everything, but at least not for the workers of this species, that's it that we are working on. So this is also was interesting because made me think that now I want to see if it, this pattern will continue the same if we test and made the same experimental and test the fate of the diet and the larva of this species. So as I say, we are, there's no one rule and we are still learning a lot of, about like how can we change and understand the microbiomes associated with ants, but actually to everything, including us. Well, what have you found with ant microbiomes? I mean, what's interesting or unique about them? So, for example, uh, one thing that I like to study microbiomes associated with ants, it is ants is a group like who live in society. They live inside of a colony. They can live alone. So it's a good system for applying questions uh, like how the social interactions can affect the microbiome. And if you were thinking in a big picture, we can apply several of these models and questions for even our species, right? Because we still, and now in pandemic, not so much, but we also live in society. <laughs> well, okay. So I mean, again, what, what specifically are you observing in, in ant microbiomes? You know, like for instance, I know that ants will culture fungus sometimes. So do you yeah. see that fungus appearing in their microbiome or there are bacteria in them or fungi that work with the fungi that cultivate or, you know, you have, um, you know, I guess different predators that prey on ants. I mean, you have some ants that are venomous. Do the venomous ones have special microbes that seem to produce the venom for them? Like, what have you discovered? <laughs> so everything that you say, probably there's a lot of people working on all of them. So for example, we have in just one ant that I'm working right now, just one single ant, I found more than 1000 different bacteria. And I'm sure that the sequencing uh, it is good, but definitely not catting the entire diversity of bacteria associated with them. So, for example, we know for other species that they have also fungus associated and could be that this fungus could be like food for ants, but could be also this fungus could be pathogenic for the ants. So that's very like depend of the ants that we are talking about, depend of the system that we are applying. And that's a he, uh, the, the entire like unknown microbiome that she, we are discovering. And for sure, several of the species of the bacteria and fungus that we are discovering associated with ants, no one ever discovered yet. So we still have a lot of things like to work in the future, considering like what is the function of all of this diversity of bacteria and fungus that we are discovering. So that's an, another level of years and years to be studying for other people's development. So we still are just like this technology that we have available now. It is great, but it's still very limited for answer all of these amazing questions that we can think about it when we are talking about insects and microbiome. Have you tried looking at ants in different conditions to see as their microbiome changes? Um, if you look at the microbiome of the queen versus like the workers or the drones or whatever you call them, you know, what does that look like? I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm sure there's tons of things to see. What have you observed? Yeah, yeah. So for example, we know one ants that uh, Campanados ants, they're famous to have one specific bacteria that call Glockmonia. We have opportunity in my PhD to collect like entire colonies, see inside of the colony, all, all of different castas that was available there. So we compare the microbiome of inside of the queens, inside of the eggs, inside of the workers, and we the larvae, the males, and we are able to see like how it, they are similar with each other between like inside of the species level, but also could, could be a very like similar inside of the colony. That means that the ants for this species, they are interacting so much with each other that it's able to 
a kind of keep all the microbiomes pretty similar inside of the colony. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. So that was pretty fascinating. But in, in that specific uh, paper uh, that we work on, uh, we have the opportunity to see that the larva has a great diversity compared to the other castes inside of the colony. And that's, we, we think it, it, this is an answered because the larva stage is where the ants are feeding, uh, are, are eating a lot, right? Because they need to be like all of this food for the next development stage that it's poop where they are not eating anything for a long time until they they are born. So in the larva, they have more food and that's probably because they have more diversity of uh, microbiomes associated. But that's pretty much what we know about like at least these specific questions, these specific species of ants. We still have like more than... Now we know so far that we have more than 13,000 of different species of ants in the world and millions and millions of different bacteria that is probably some of them bring a bunch of benefits for these ants and some of them, these bacteria could be also be prejudicial for these ants. So we still have a lot of things to learn uh, about this the entire system. But if you compare amongst ant species, since there's so many of them, I would think that they would be common you know, bacteria that are in most of them and some that are unique to only certain species. I, Have you yes, been I able think, to observe that? Yes, I think, I think, yes, there are some bacteria that it's probably like related to just one species. And that's what we are seeing so far. We do know that there are some bacteria that it's more broadly for not the entire, all the uh, ants that we know so far, but for similar for several other species, uh, not necessarily related ants. So, for example, Rhizobialis, we know that Rhizobialis is uh, it's bringing especially uh, nutrition benefits for ants, and it is not associated with just one specific genus of ants, that it's more broadly th- thinking in, in phylogeny perspective. But it's still, we don't know, there is no just one bacteria that it's just happening in the entire, all the ants that we know so far. Not that we know yet, but... Maybe next year, maybe tomorrow. Are you able to figure out the metabolites that, uh, you know, the bacteria you found produce that work with the ants that, you know, are part of their symbiosis, I guess, with the ants? Have you have been, you know, it's, I know sequencing is great, but if it's 16S, I don't know if it tells you much, even if it's shotgun, I know, but then it doesn't tell you about the metabolites that they may share back and forth and what the role is. Have you been able to figure out the role of any of these bacteria? And yeah, again, that's what substances a, they're doing. That's an excellent question. So for my studies, I'm focused more in the amplicon sequence, so the 16S, as you say. So my question is, it's for now answer more ecological questions. So we are not focused in the whole metagenomics, shotgun metagenomics, but we for ants, uh, other collaborators or the friends of mine, they were able for to discover that. Yeah, for, for example, turtle ants, that it's called like genus cephalodes, there is some bacteria that able to increase uh, the nutrition of the ants by recycling nitrogen. So, and there is this bacteria bringing these benefits for the host. And they did that exactly using the whole shotgun metagenomic to discover. So yeah, there is some bacteria that our people are discovering that there is benefits, but there is still few studies that was able to actually demonstrate it, what is the function. And for example, for Volbachia that I already mentioned before, we still have, there's just last year that there's two studies that show that Volbachia could accelerate, accelerate this, the, the cycle of the colony. If you like this podcast, 
please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. And other paper for other different species just show up that Wolbachia could be uh, bringing also nutritional benefits in terms of vitamins for the host. But yet, is this is actually happen for the entire ant family or this is more related for some specific strains of Wolbachia? We still don't know and we still have a lot of things to discover. What, what is Wolbachia, by the way? So Wolbachia is one of the most common bacteria that we know that it's associated with insects. But for example, mm. for ants, besides this bold study that I mentioned before, we still don't know nothing what its effects for the host. And that's fascinating. Like how one of the most famous bacteria associated with the ants, with insects, we still know so little about the effects on the host. Yeah, I'm interested again, like in bullet ants. You know, I know that they... Um you know, I guess sting and, uh, and, and really cause people a lot of pain. But what, what does it, the bullet ants, you know, have you been, have you looked at them, for instance, to see if they have no, unique bacteria I, that facilitate the venom? You know? Yeah, I didn't have opportunity to look for those. How, how much would that cost, by the way? Would that be very difficult or take a long time to do, to, to do a targeted uh, sequence like that on bullet ants? I don't think it is much uh, expensive because this technology is now is not, it is getting less and less expensive over the years. But I think it is also depend where you work, like what is your facility? Like I know inside, inside of Cornell, we have some discount for people here. So I'm not sure if this price will change in a different states, but it's not so expensive as it used to be when I was in Brazil in 2017. So here in the U.S., it is not that expensive. Probably oh, okay. we're spending more collecting them. Interesting. Well, yeah. what experimentation do you want to do? I mean, what signals are you getting or what interesting uh, data are you getting so far from the, the sequencing you've done? So now I'm focusing a study with cephalodes, uh, the turtle ends that I mentioned before. And I, I want to use uh, well-supported phylogeny to see the signal for the microbiome's coevolution associated with all of this uh, diversity inside of cephalodes turtle. So hopefully as soon we will be submitting this paper and we are trying to see now in a different way, like every single groups of bacteria can have a different life history and some of them could be co-evolving, but not all of them. So let's see, stay tuned. <laughs> Again, what are you trying to figure out in terms of co-evolution? <clears throat> How would you determine that so, a bacteria has co-evolved with, with a given ant? What would you look for? That is a really great question. So one thing that because we have a, a, will, a well-supported a phylogeny of the host, so we are mm -hmm. able to actually map how the this diversity of ants could be like combined with the diversity of a bacteria inside of this. And so if we in, like try to explain this more a simple way, basically what we can try to measure is the phylogeny of the ants will be pretty much like mirror the phylogeny of the specific bacteria that we are looking for. So that means that if bacteria, it is evolving together with the host, if they have similar phylogenies, like it's mirror one. So that means that probably this bacteria are being was quite a long time ago in the evolutionary scale and they are be changing together over the year. Again, how would you expect them to change together? Like what, you know, if you go into summer or into winter, you know, based on the uh, the dynamics of an ant colony. Like like again, let's say they, you know, they like to harvest fungus in the summer. I'm just making this up. You know, have you done any studies where you sequence them at the beginning of the summer and the end of the summer and see how they're, you know, they're uh, their microbiomes change before and after the fungus harvesting and you know what does yeah. that tell you like what would you do yeah so so depend of the project that we are doing the question that we want to answer we have several flavors how different species or different questions could change what we expect right so for cephalodes projects we are not expect to see changes in like summer and winter but if you want to see the effects of changing temperature or seasonality we can definitely do experimental with that. And I know that there are some people that are using this kind of questions to apply for climate change. So they are seeing like, if we change the temperature, we are changing the entire bacteria and the entire microbiome in that uh, specific in that specific organism. And that could be means that like, 
making predictions for the future if we, this climate change happen like and change what we have what like how the ants are the insects are used to right now we can probably like this could mean could be mean that we are like declining even more the insects that we have and we have so many benefits that these insects could bring to us right so i think it definitely the pain of the questions that you're going to do, there's a plenty of microbiome questions uh, that could be applied. Do you see any assistance or help from people that are looking at the microbiome, let's say of scorpions or of bees? Are, you know, are there any other creatures and microbiomes that you think would be very useful to study based on uh, on what you're seeing so far? Yeah, so I have some friends that it's working with microbiomes and bees. And they're, for example, are seeing the effect of pesticides uh, trying to change, like uh, how the pesticides could be affecting the microbiome of these associated bees. And that could be this meaning that this is, could be one of the reason why the bees are being killed. So yeah, that is a really nice system and could be definitely applied for other insects as well. well. What's the best way for people to find out more about your research? Where can they go? Oh, that's nice question. So I have my I have my website and I also uh, I'm working with one of the amazing women science and also biologist, Dr. Karma Rowe. And she she kept a very nice website and Twitter about everything that we are doing. So you can follow Kari Moreau in the Twitter or myself as well. Thank you. I want to thank you for coming. By the no, way. thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.